Uh, I have like um, the flu or strep throat or something today. So I don't know if my voice will make it all the way through the lecture. So we'll see. See what happens. Uh, I can probably talk a little bit quieter. If you can't hear me, you can, I guess, listen to the audio next time on the, on the video. You'll also get the click clack of the halls going around my throat. <laughs> Teeth. OK, so today's lecture is about um, simulations. So uh, as we mentioned last time, we defined the one tape Turing machine. And this is going to be our like, official model for algorithms, this one right here. But as I mentioned to you, there are many variants of Turing machines, and uh, ones that are more or less realistic. And uh, luckily, as we'll see somewhat today, we'll see some examples, they can all simulate each other. So by this uh, Church-Turing thesis, we kind of know that, or believe that they can all uh, compute the same functions or the same decision problems. But in fact, they can all simulate each other uh, somewhat efficiently, too, which is reassuring. So the notion of polynomial time on one is the same as polynomial time on both. Um, and these facts also have some important theoretical consequences as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, these facts today, the fact that these different models can somewhat efficiently simulate each other. Um, and that'll be good. For example, we know that actually Sipser takes this as his model of uh, official model of computation, the Turing machine with a one-way infinite tape. Maybe it looks like it might be a little bit less powerful than the Turing machine with a two-way infinite tape. But as we'll see, it's not. Actually, in complexity theory, they usually actually take the multi-tape Turing machine as the sort of basic model. Um, but we're going to use the one-tape Turing machine because it's a little simpler. And finally, eventually, you know, when you actually write algorithms and reason about algorithms, you end up doing it in you know, some kind of uh, pseudocode that looks like C, where you have random access to memory and so forth. But luckily, as, as I said, uh, all of these models can relatively efficiently simulate this model. OK. So um, let me tell you some things that we're going to prove today or talk about today. Mm. So probably the main theorem that we'll prove today is this one that uh, if you write some code for a multi-tape Turing machine, I haven't defined that yet, but I'll do it later in class, and it runs in time t, you can uh, convert it to code running on a one-tape Turing machine that runs in time t squared. Now, I have to say a few things about what all this means, so let me do that. I'm actually going to draw a bunch of arrows on this uh, diagram along these lines. And this is the main one I'll prove today. Uh, so this is, I don't know, somehow a fact or a definition. I'm going to draw a bunch of arrows here that look like this <coughs> from some kind of model or programming language A to another model or programming language B. And I might label it with some arrow, like the uh, arrow with something like t squared. And what this means or indicates is that you can, you might call it compile. Or maybe simulate code in A to, uh, we call it code M sub A in A to code M sub B in model B, such that if M A runs in time T, Then MB runs in time t squared. <coughs> OK, and I'll, uh, it won't always be t squared, so I might put here like t log t or something. Let me actually add here as well big O of t squared. Now, I underline this because I didn't actually define what this means. So let me define that now. Um, so of course, in complexity theory, we're often going to be talking about running times. And this is a definition that you might have seen in 251, but I'll make it again. It's one of the most important definitions in complexity theory. So let's let m be uh, 
a decider algorithm in some model like Turing machine. Decider, remember, means that it always holds on all inputs. We don't consider algorithms that don't have this property. Uh, so the running time or time complexity of M is a function Okay, so this might be something that looks a little bit funny at first. The fact that it's not like a, a number, but, but it's a function. Uh, t mapping natural numbers to natural numbers with the following definition. T of n is the max over inputs of length n of the number of steps m takes on x. Okay, so let me make some comments about this definition. Um, this is well defined. This is what we, one reason we really like Turing machines. It's very clear exactly how many steps they take when you run a particular Turing machine on a, tur a particular input x. It's just the number of transitions until it halts. Um, as the, always kind of in complexity theory, another aspect of this definition is that we focus on like the worst case time complexity. So for a given length of input n, we look over the, all the inputs. We find the worst input in terms of how long it makes the machine run for. And the final remark to make about this definition is that um, it's a function because we really care about how the running time scales with the size of the input. Okay, so we're not usually so interested in how many steps the Turing machine takes on inputs of size 3, 4, or 5, but like how does the number of steps grow as the size of the input grows? Okay, any questions about this definition? This is an important one for us. Okay, so it captures how long the uh, Turing machine takes to run on uh, inputs of the worst input of length n. Okay, so now with that definition in place, you can make some sense of this. For example, this arrow I've drawn up here. indicates that, again, we haven't defined multi-tape Turing machines yet. You might have guessed or imagined what they are, but what we're going to show is that if you have some code uh, running in a multi-tape Turing machine in time t, with time complexity t, you can make a one-tape Turing machine that does the same thing with time complexity t squared. OK, so let me uh, tell you some other facts about our simulations. Um, so you might ask about the other direction. Well, uh, as you might guess, this direction is kind of trivial. Uh, a one-tape Turing machine is like a special case of a multi-tape Turing machine. So if you have a one-tape Turing machine with time complexity t, well, it's just it's already a multi-tape Turing machine with the same time complexity. So I can simulate one in this one on this machine in time t. Uh, Another thing that we won't really talk about too much, if I have time, I might sketch it a tiny bit, but like how you can <coughs> excuse me, simulate kind of uh, code that you write and pseudocode that you write when you're just writing an algorithm informally on a multi-tape Turing machine. This can be done with slowdown also quadratic. Okay, so we probably won't prove that, but I might indicate a little bit about why it's true. And actually, by putting things, these things together, you can uh, infer something I told you last time that if you take you know, code that you write that's like C-like pseudocode and you want to actually make it run on a one-tape Turing machine, you can do that with slowdown that's like a fourth power, okay, which is not very great, but it at least shows that anything that runs in polynomial time in this model can also be made to run in polynomial time in this model. Yeah? Is there an assumption that it's two-way infinite and for all the tapes that are not that one at the top of it? Um, yeah, it's not very important as well. I indicate a little bit today the difference between two-way infinite and one-way infinite is not very great, but uh, let's assume that these ones also have two-way infinite tapes. Um, this direction is also pretty easy. Uh, it's basically you just have to imagine that you could write a pretty efficient simulator of a multi-tape Turing machine in you know, some C-like pseudocode, which you can imagine. 
it depends exactly what this uh, cost is, how you define the RAM model, but let me say it's something like T log T. Okay, so it's pretty efficient. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this today. If you want to go between Sipser's model with only a one-way infinite tape and R2 way, um, actually you can do this with very low, little slowdown. So I put T here, but remember that's because I'm hiding a big O here. So anything that, any one tape Turing machine you have that uses a two-way infinite tape, you convert it to a Turing machine that uses a one-way infinite tape, and they run at about the same time up to a constant factor. Um, the other direction is pretty trivial as well. You actually have to take a little bit of care to convert a one-way infinite tape to a two-way infinite tape, but it's not too bad. And here I want to give one more example. With our Turing machines, we allow them to use any tape alphabet they want. Let me assume that the input alphabet is just 0 and 1. So if you want to use lots of symbols, 100 symbols for your tape alphabet, that's fine. You might wonder, what about if you insist that your tape should only have zeros, ones, and blanks? Could that, you know, cause big problems? Well, as it turns out, it doesn't cause too much trouble. You can also simulate a general Turing machine with just zeros, ones, and blanks on the tape with only linear slowdown. Basically by encoding all the symbols into zeros and ones. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some tricks that you might use to do these simulations. And uh, the main one I want to talk about eventually is this one. Simulating a multi-tape Turing machine on a one-tape Turing machine. <coughs> Any questions about this? Yeah. Um, why could it be a um, yeah, you're asking about this one? It's a good question. I didn't look at it too carefully because actually honestly, it's a little bit it's a little bit unclear the best way to define this like RAM model. So I'm actually gonna leave it a little bit underspecified. You know, uh, there are these like kind of annoying questions like, you know, when you're writing pseudocode, you say for i equals one to n. And so implicitly in there, there's like a step that's like i equals i plus 1. Well, does that take you like log n time or like time 1? On one hand, you feel like it takes you time 1. On the other hand, if you're like incrementing a number that's like potentially log n bits, you know, does that cost you log n time? So in order to find these things carefully, you have to think about these issues. And I don't want to do it exactly. So I actually sort of put this log t in there just so like for safety. Um, yeah, so we're not going to get into very uh, careful details about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this, this picture is to sort of reassure you that all these models are more or less equivalent, even not just in terms of what they compute, but in how efficiently they can compute things. And um, yeah. Another thing I want to point out is that you know these are actually important theorems uh, in complexity theory. And like every one of these theorems or every one of these arrows, to prove it, you give an algorithm. I mean, what we're going to eventually show here is some like algorithm that takes, or some method that takes, let's say, multi-tape Turing machine <coughs> code and converts it to one-tape Turing machine code. So this is an illustration of something I mentioned in the first class, that like many of the results in complexity theory, which is a topic that's supposed to be about showing negative results for algorithms, actually involves <coughs> just algorithm coding. Um, there's actually one more model that I want to mention. We won't talk about it today, but we'll probably talk about it in uh, later classes. Let me put it out here. It says Boolean circuits. So this is quite a different fun way of uh, computing Boolean functions or computing um, uh, decision problems. Again, you might have seen it in 251. And it's actually imp an important fact that these are also related uh, the efficiency of these circuits in computing functions is related to the efficiency of Turing machines. Um, quite an important theorem is that actually if you have a Turing machine running in some time t, uh, you can make Boolean circuits that compute the same uh, function or solve the same problem in time about t squared. Actually, if you're really sophisticated, you can do t log t, but that's a bit hard to prove. Um, on the other hand, for some interesting reason, we'll see later, this direction is false. For the general model of what you can compute with Boolean circuits, you actually can't compute it to Turing machines at all, in general. Um, and that's for a funny reason, the fact that 
for Boolean circuits, they have this property called non-uniformity, which we'll talk about later, which means you get to give a different algorithm for every input line, which is a bit strange. So we won't talk about circuits anymore today, but I wanted to mention that to you now. OK. So in order to get into details of simulations, uh, I guess I'm just going to show you some like Turing machine programming tricks. Because in the end, we're going to have to you know, describe some Turing machines for solving various problems. Mm. So let me start slowly with uh, describing some Turing machine variants and how you, know, you can simulate them with our normal version of the Turing machine. So let's say we wanted to um, allow Turing machines to stay put in a step. Besides just going left and right. So in our normal definition of Turing machine, every step, the head moves either left or right. But suppose we wanted to also allow you to just have it stay in the same place. So that's a new model of a Turing machine, a Turing machine with like stay put. But in fact, it's quite easy to show that it doesn't really give the Turing machine much more power. The new Turing machine can't compute anything the old one can't. And in fact, the new Turing machine model can be simulated quite efficiently with our standard Turing machine model. So can somebody suggest how you can um, handle this? Yeah? Um, replace every step that stays put with a intermediate step that goes left and goes right? Right, yeah. You just have to make sure if you want to stay put, just you know, artificially go left and then come back right. So actually, let me write it down just so that it's uh, a little bit more clear. So let's say you have some code for a Turing machine that also has this, that, that uses this stay put feature. So maybe like one line might be like, um, well, let's say if you're in state QI and you're reading a zero, then you know, write a one and stay put and go to state QJ. Okay. That's what like a line or a transition in a, a Turing machine with stay put ability might look like. Okay, so how would we convert this to uh, a Turing machine that did the same thing, but you know, just use the normal left and right abilities? I guess, we'll see if I do this correctly. I would convert this line to a few lines. I would convert it to uh, QI. If I'm in state QI and I'm reading a 0, well, I'm going to still write a 1. And let's say I'll go right. And then, well, I'm going to have to invent a new state. So I'm going to invent a new state called maybe uh, go left, then J. Okay. This is the name of a new state I just invented for my Turing machine. Okay, and then I'll have to make a new uh, transitions for this state. So if I'm in state go left, then J, and I'm reading a zero, what should I do? Pardon me? I should write a zero because I don't want to touch this uh, new cell that I went on to. I just went on it artificially so I could come back, go left, and then go to QJ, which is where I meant to go originally. Okay, and I need this also if I'm reading one, and also if I'm reading blank. In fact, I need it for every tape symbol. I need a line that looks like this. I'm just assuming in this example that I have three tape symbols, zero, one, and blank. Okay, so for every line that looks like this in this new model that has state puts, I have to invent a new state. Well, I can reuse these states actually, but I'm going to have to invent a new state that looks like this for every old state and make these kinds of updates. Is it okay? Yep. Referring to you're on the first symbol of the state, and if you go left, you're like at the same position. Uh -huh. I'm assuming we're in our, the model of this class where that has like an infinite tape in both directions. So yeah, so this, um, 
Well, actually, this would work even, I think, in the model where you only have a one-way infinite tape, because I sort of arbitrarily decided that if I'm going to stay put, I'll do right then left. I mean, with the two-way infinite tape, I could have equally well done left and right. Um, but I guess this works even in like Sipser's model, where you have a, a one-way infinite tape. OK. Great. So that's an example, a very simple example of like a simulation result. Or you imagine a Turing machine with more power, but you show that you can simulate it with about uh, with a Turing machine with less power. And actually, since we have it up here, let's discuss the running time. So if you have a Turing machine that uh, uses stay put feature and runs in time t, that's a function, remember, how can you bound the running time of this new, new code that you wrote that simulates it? Was it upper bound? Yep. Yeah, 2t. So if this, this kind of machine with stay put ran in time t, our simulation runs in time at most 2t. Right? Because in the worst case, like maybe there's tons and tons of stay put steps here. Every time you do a stay put step, you need to do uh, artificially two steps in the simulation. Okay? So that's an example of a really efficient simulation for us. This is like big O of t, so we're very cool with that. Okay. Um, let me know another simple example. Let's say we uh, want to get even more liberal with what we allow in terms of uh, head movement. So I just showed how you could introduce a stay put move. Let's say you want to allow also a double left or a double right head movement. So instead of instructions where the head goes left or right, I'm going to let you also write down like double left or double right. And it goes two steps to the left or two steps to the right. Um, OK, so let's see how we could simulate that. In this uh, new kind of code, you might have a, a line that looks like this. QI, if you're in state QI, and you're reading symbol 0, maybe write a symbol 1 and go left twice and go to QJ. And so if we want to allow, or we want to simulate you know, this kind of Turing machine with this extra head movement with a normal Turing machine, what should we do? How should we translate this line of code? Yeah? You can use the same trick if you have like an intermediate go left to J state. Yeah. In fact, we can use actually this. I shouldn't have had it on a hidden board like this. We can use literally, I think, exactly the same kind of uh, go left then J state. Um, in fact, I think we can literally change this to QI. If you're in state QI and reading 0, write a 1, go left, and then you go to this go left then J state where I literally use exactly the same thing. And this go left and J state has the feature that it basically doesn't touch the tape, just keeps us, uh, the tape cells the same, and goes to left again, and goes to state J. OK, and similarly, we could have, uh, we could allow these like double right movements, and we'd have to introduce like, some states called go right then J. OK. Great. So those are a couple of relatively simple Turing machine tricks. Let's do one that's uh, not too much more difficult, but it's quite useful for writing Turing machine code. This is a Turing machine trick called marking a cell. Um, OK, so when you're designing Turing machine code, You've got your tape here. You've got some symbols on here. Something like this. You've got your head somewhere here. And um, there sometimes like, comes a time in your code where you're like, I really wish I could like, maybe just put a mark on this cell so that I could remember that I was over here, the head was over here. Then I have the cherry machine go do something else, but I want it 
to put a mark on the cell so it can like know to come back to here. Right. Um, so you really wish the Turing machine could just do this. Put a mark here, and in that way, like it'll like remember something about the cell. You know, for example, if you want to write Turing machine that code that like copied some stretch of the tape to some other part of the tape, you might wish to like put a mark on the tape to remember like the beginning of where you were copying from. For example. Um, so how can we do this? How can we allow it to like mark a tape cell? Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So you can just let this be zero with a mark be like a new tape cell character. Yeah. What if you wanted to support arbitrary number of marks? Different kinds of marks or like in different locations? Yeah, you can have different kinds of marks. You can have, we'll see in a sec, I think it'll become a little bit clear. But for example, you could support like two different kinds of marks, like a dot and a star or something. Let me get back to that in a second. Let's say for now we just want one kind of mark. Um, so the way you can do this is like, um, just double the tape alphabet. For example, if your tape alphabet before was 0, 1, and blank, just make a Turing machine with new tape alphabet, 0, 1, blank, 0 with a mark, 1 with a mark, blank with a mark. OK, and that's fine. We're always allowed to make as many, well, alpha tape alphabet, whatever we want, as long as it's finite. So in fact, you can see now if you wanted another kind of mark, like with a star, um, you just like triple the size of the tape alphabet and introduce like a starred version of all the variants, of all the characters. So you could have any finite number of different marks. And um, let me sketch out like an example of when you might use this kind of strategy. Um, Uh, so let me talk a little bit about um, this arrow. So let's say you're like Sipser and you wanted to find your Turing machines to be only one way infinite. I've said that several times, but maybe I didn't make it clear. So in Sipser, like, the tape has a left edge. It's only infinite like this way. So you write the input here. Um, and now you actually have to make a somewhat arbitrary decision. You have to define in your Turing machine what happens if the tape head is here and the Turing machine decides to go left. With a two-way infinite tape, there's no problem. You just let it go left. Um, so usually the way you just define it is just, if it tries to go left here, then it just stays put. So that's fine. So that's how like Sipser defines his Turing machines. Um, so let's imagine how we might take a Sipser Turing machine and like simulate it on our kind of Turing machine that has a two-way infinite tape. At first, it looks like there might be no problem because somehow a two-way infinite tape is more powerful than a one-way infinite tape. But there's at least a tiny bit of subtlety because, you know, Sipser's model has this, like, feature that, like, if you're at the left end of the tape cell and you go left, then the head just stays put, which is something that doesn't automatically happen on our two-way infinite tape. So you actually kind of have to account for that. Uh, but it's not such a big deal. Uh, so, in particular, let's say you had a um, Turing machine code written in Sipser style, so it expected the tape to be one-way infinite, and you wanted to convert it to code that ran with a two-way infinite tape. Well, one thing you might want, then, is for, like, the the Turing machine to like know where the left end of the tape is. So one way you can do this is to use this marking trick that I was just talking about. 
So you could just take the code that runs on a one-way infinite tape, and maybe the first thing you'll do is have it start out by like marking this cell where it starts. And then in the future, that's good because like the Turing machine as it's going along, simulating this on like a two-way infinite tape, if the head ever comes back here on a Sipser style machine, if it does a left from here, you want it to actually stay put. You actually have to simulate that feature on your two-way tape. If you just let the Turing machine code run as is, it'll like accidentally go into this two-way infinite tape that you're using. Okay, so you have to add, add uh, a little bit, update the code a little bit, sort of always be checking if the head is at what is the sort of fictional left end of the tape, or simulated left end of the tape. And you can do that by having it always look for this marked cell. Yeah? Um, could you also put a mark one left to that, and then if you ever do it, you just go right without having to simulate the stay in steps? Yeah, so the suggestion was you could also, at the beginning, maybe put a mark over here, and, or some other special character here, and then have, uh, always have checks if the head gets to this special character, just go back right one. So actually, in fact, probably the way I'm about to describe it is like a little bit more, possibly a little bit more complicated than it needs to be, but I want to illustrate this marking idea with something. Yeah, so there's always uh, several different ways you can uh, solve these problems. Let me like spell it out though, just as you can see what I'm talking about. So with my solution, I mean, you're gonna mainly take the code written for the one-way infinite tape Turing machine and just call it the new code for the two-way infinite uh, uh, Turing machine. Well, you have to modify it a little bit. So the first thing you would do is um, modify uh, the Turing machine. So the first step adds a mark. Let's say goes right and then goes back left. Okay, that will just have the feature of putting a mark on the tape. Uh, actually, I could have just used the stay put feature. Um, all right, in fact, let me do that. So, I mean, that's actually not allowed in our formal model, but I showed you 10 minutes ago how you could like add the stay put feature to your TM. Uh, with very little slowdown. So you have a new state, new Q0, and it would look like this. If you're reading a zero, write zero with a mark, and I'll use the stay put feature, and then I'll go to the state like called the old Q0. And similarly, one, I'd write a one, stay put and go to the old starting state, and if it's a blank, I'll write a blank with a star, stay put, and go to the old starting state. Okay, here I'm assuming that the old starting state was called old Q0. And now, uh, furthermore, I have to implement this feature that we always watch out for this marked state, and if we try to go left while in the marked, sorry, this marked tape cell, if we try to go left while looking at this marked tape cell, we just, in fact, stay put. So the idea here is for each, it's very hard to read, for each old state, if it's reading a marked symbol, And going left, stay put instead. Okay, so for example, if formally the code had something like mm, if you're in state QI and you're reading a zero, maybe write a one, go left, and go to state QJ. Okay, then you would change it to, well, what would I change it to? Yeah. 
leave that one as is and you would add another one um, with, with zero marked to one marked and the state. Very good, yeah. So I have to change it to two things. And as was stated, I have to leave this one as it is. So if you're in state in the new code, if you're in state QI and you see an unmarked zero, then it means you're not at this like fictional left end of the tape. So you just proceed as you normally did. But we need also the line for if you're reading a zero and it's marked zero, that means you're at the left end of the tape. So you should change it to a marked one, so you preserve the mark. And you should use the stay put feature, and then you go to stay QJ. Okay, any questions about this? So again, you can see in terms of efficiency, like, uh, I guess, in fact, um, in this simulation, the new Turing machine runs in pretty much the same number of steps as the old Turing machine, except that you might have to like, lose a factor of two because of all these new state puts that you implemented. Because this really actually gets converted to two steps when you change the state put to doing a right and a left. Okay. Let me do one more one or two more Turing machine tricks. And then we'll get to this main simulation. Okay, let me talk about this trick. Stretching an input. Hmm. Let me try this chalk. Okay, so what I mean by this. Let's imagine you have a tape. And uh, let's say it starts out. I'm going to use A's and B's here for fun. Well, that's the input, A, B, A, A. And you want to uh, stretch it out so that there's uh, blanks between each of the symbols. So that it looks like this. A blank, B blank, A blank, A blank. Okay, how would you accomplish this? I'm going to describe how you would accomplish this, uh, but let's not go all the way down to the level of like exactly writing the state transitions. Okay, now that we've seen a bunch of tricks, we can be a little bit more informal about how we describe uh, what we're going to do. So can somebody give me like a high level description of how to go from here to here? Are, are blanks allowed in the input? Like in the part? No, no, blanks are never allowed in the input. So we're imagining this is like the beginning of the Turing machine run, and the input symbols are A and B, when the tape alphabet is A, B blank. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, maybe you can start by uh, just saying that, OK, I see an A in the front, so let me go to the very end of my input, and then write one A there, uh, and then sort of uh, I don't know, go back, copy the B. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Except you don't want, I mean, I like the idea of going all the way to the right, but like the first thing you want to probably do is maybe, uh, I mean, copy this one over one. Or you want to copy? Oh, yeah, everything you need to kind of copy over. No, but you can't copy over one. Mm. All right. You have an idea, Carol? Um, well, it's not too bad to just like move everything one cell to the right, right? So, I mean, it's not that efficient, but I could just like, keep doing that. To move everything over one cell to the right. 
That's something that you can do with like one pass, you know. So how exactly, I mean, in a little bit more detail? So it's like, I get to A there, right? I started to B, then I move everything to the right, then I go back, then I go to the second A, and like move everything one to the right again. Yeah, that's what I think my solution, of which there's more than one kind of looked like. So you're saying you have like a main loop or like one main ability, which is like kind of shift everything to the right by one. And I guess you want to start uh, doing that on like the, here, the BAA. You like shift it all over so you have like A blank BAA. And then you need the Turing machine to come back to the left. How does it know where to come back to? Um, when you see a space. Yeah, when you see a space. So good, let's try to, let's kind of sketch out what we want. So it starts out like this, A, B, A, A. And then we kind of want to copy this segment over one, so it'll look like A blank B, A, A. We can come back this way until it sees this blank, and then go over here and copy this over. Yeah, so it'll look like A blank B blank A, A. So it'll be sort of an outer loop here. Now it's over here, it'll come back until it sees this blank, go over a little bit and shift this substring over. A blank B blank A blank A. And how does it tell it's done? When you go back again and you see a space, right? Yeah, it's kind of like if you go back, like when you're copying here, you shift this over and then you kind of go left searching for a space. And you can kind of tell like, if it happens right away that you hit a space, like that's when you know that you've got to the end. So it's a little, I mean, you have to think a little bit carefully about how to nail that down, but if you see a space like a blank like really quickly, like really soon when you're going back, then you know that you're at the end. And then say I suppose I wanted you to actually, after having stretched out the input, get all the way back to the beginning. How would you do that? Look for two spaces in a row? Yeah, you can go back and look for two blanks in a row, which there will artificially be here. Yeah. Um, so let's write that out in like a little bit more detail. Uh, not full detail, but a little bit of detail. So my code is going to look something like the following, if I got it right. Maybe go right once. <coughs> That'll take you to the B. And then, now we have to implement this like copying step of like shifting the tape uh, one cell to the right. And you can actually do that in one pass. So you can do that by the following. Sort of remember in the state um, the symbol you're on, write a blank, and go right. And uh, I'm going to expand on this like quotation mark remember in a second. Um, uh, okay. In fact, uh, repeatedly do this. It's a poorly written loop, but sorry. Do this uh, until you hit hit a blank. Okay, and this will have the effect of like copying, sorry, copying the tape one cell to the right. Let me say more, a few more things about this uh, phrase remember in quotes. So this is something you do often in Turing machines. You can use like your state to somehow remember something. So when you're doing this copying, you need to do, uh, uh, the first thing you do if you're here, you know, you'll be reading a B, so you'll like have a, go to a new state that uh, says, go right and remember, you know, maybe the new state will be called go right and write B. You also need a state that says go right and then write an A. And it, which one you use will depend on whether this is a B or A. So somehow you can, by using uh, different states, you can get like Turing machines to like remember a limited amount of information, like for the, the future. So is it kind of clear how you can do this? Okay. 
Okay, so that will have the effect of shifting the tape to the right. So maybe it'll get us from here to here. Okay, and now we need to go back. So as we said, we're going to have like another step that's like, keep going left. Until you hit a blank. And then as stated uh, before, like, if you hit that blank immediately, that's the signifier that you're kind of done. So you might say, go to a state called finish up. Else, go back to the beginning. Um, okay. And then finally, this finish up state. We'll like go left until you see two blanks. Okay, so this is an example of me describing a Turing machine without putting in like 100% of the details, right? I mean, to actually, let's say, implement this, go left until you see two blanks, you actually have to think a little bit about how you would do it. You know, you're going to have a state that repeatedly walks left until it sees a blank, and then it's going to have like a sort of go to another state, which will like, having gone left, check to see if it has another blank, and then it knows it'll be done. And then, in fact, it'll probably maybe want to walk a couple of steps to the right to like truly finish up to get, come back from those two blanks. It'll cost you a few more states and so forth. Um, but you know, as we go along, I'm going to start describing Turing machines a bit more at this level on the theory that you've had some practice with it on the homework and so forth and so on. And also because it's just aggravating to you know, actually write everything out in this terrible programming language. Okay, but there's a few like, subtleties and edge cases here, but uh, any questions about it? All right. Uh, great. So I'm going to talk about one more, not in great detail, one more uh, Turing machine trick. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the main simulation that I wanted to tell you about, multi-tape Turing machines to one-tape Turing machines. Last one I wanted to tell you about before the main one was this arrow. Uh, um, taking a one tape Turing machine with an arbitrary tape alphabet and converting it to one tape Turing machine with just 0, 1, and blank for its tape alphabet. So let's talk about simulating um, you know, a general alphabet with a tape alphabet that's just 0, 1, and blank. OK, and let me not do it completely. Generally, I'll just for an example, imagine you had a tape alphabet that looked like 0, 1, blank, 0, mark, 1, mark, blank, mark, and hash. OK, so maybe you like designed a Turing machine. And you, you know, found it convenient to have marking of cells. And also, you found it convenient to have like a punctuation mark. And now I told you, well, I'm not going to allow that. I'm only going to allow your tape to have 0, 1, and blank. OK, and all the while, let me assume that the input alphabet is 0 and 1. OK? So because, I mean, if I want you to get your tape alphabet down to 0, 1, and blank, that you know, means your, your input alphabet has to be a subset of this. So let's assume the input alphabet is 0 and 1. But I really want you to be conservative with the symbols. And again, what I want to show you is that you can do this simulation kind of efficiently, and you only lose a constant factor um, in the running time. OK. Does somebody have a suggestion for this? Yeah, sorry? We did before, like, encode each of these in binary. Like, find an encoding for each of them, and 
like if you can change your Turing machine to be to read instead of reading the symbol like once, like make like two pass like read the symbol like two at a time and then see the what symbol it corresponds to. Exactly. It's a serious suggestion as well. Yeah. So the idea is um, by encoding. So you can invent an encoding for these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven symbols by just bits. So for example, hypothetically, you can call this one zero, zero, I don't know, zero, one. Um, it's actually important to encode blank with two blanks. I'll say why in a second. Uh, zero dot could be zero blank. One dot could be one blank. Blank dot could be, what do I have left? I don't know, one, one. And this one could be one, zero. So it'll be one unused pair, I guess. Okay, so here I just artificially decided on a pair of uh, new tape symbol elements to encode my original Turing machine's tape symbol elements. And yeah, so I want to, the first thing I'll have to do basically is take the uh, input and rewrite it into this encoded format. I'll we'll have to change the Turing machine code that operated on this tape uh, alphabet. It's a little elaborate. I mean, it'll have to sort of, in its new alphabet, like look at each symbol, uh, each pair of symbols, figure out what the old machine would do, and do the corresponding thing in the new machine. Um, so for example, in like the new machine, Okay, the tape cells will be divided kind of artificially or in the new Turing machine's mind into pairs. Okay, and if it, if it looks like this, okay, that means it's kind of imagining that in its head, it's as if the old machine that had the big tape, about, tape alphabet had uh, this on it, zero, blank star, Okay, so I'm going to even be a bit more brief about how you might um, do this simulation. But maybe the first thing you would do is like stretch out the input. Exactly as how we talked about there. So you're given an input that has zeros and ones. The very first thing I'll do is run this trick to kind of stretch it out into like uh, zero and one characters and spaces. So that's a good start because now I have like room to write the encoded version of each input symbol. I'm going to go back left. Well, I already actually have that in this thing, so let me skip that. So now you'll need a bunch of states or like a sort of a subroutine to encode the input. Okay, so for example, if the input was just um, one, zero. The first thing we'll do is convert it to one blank, zero blank. And the machine now has to make another pass to say, okay, one is supposed to be encoded by I don't know, zero, one. And luckily it has room now to write zero, one. Okay, and zero is supposed to be encoded by zero, zero, so it has room to write that, etc. Okay, and now, I mean, I'm skipping a lot of steps, but like simulate the operation of the old, you know, big alphabet Turing machine. And this is going to, let's say, you could use this LL and RR tape movement that I talked about very earlier, liberally. Okay, so I mean, you'll have to you know, reach each pair, think about what the old machine would have done, update the cells appropriately. Okay, I was a little sketchy there, but any details that might worry you? Yeah? In general, um, you may have to stretch the input out of all that, just in certain blanks. Right. Right, yeah, so here I relied on the fact that luckily this big alphabet I was simulating had like at most uh, eight characters. But if it had, let's say, 100 characters, 
then uh, you know I'm encoding each character, but I only have like three options in the new tape: head zero, one, and blank. So I might need to encode each of the original hundred characters with maybe somebody help me out five uh, five characters, which in turn would mean that like in the simulation, like each batch of five consecutive tape cells would sort of correspond to one real tape cell in the original simulation, and yeah, the initial this initial stretching thing would have to involve like maybe stretching it out so that there is like uh, four blanks between each character and so forth. So yeah, it becomes more elaborate. But um, yeah, but we can actually do that without like writing any extra code because we, we can um, take like the hundred character alphabet and encode it in pairs of characters from like I, I don't know. Uh, 50 character alphabet and then encode those with pairs of characters from a 25 character alphabet using the exact same method and just keep shrinking the alphabet until we get down to three. That is true too, yeah. I think that's true. So we don't need to worry about how we would do extra stretching. We can just repeat and code it. That's right. Um, or you could, I think, would it work if you just like stretched it by one character and then, oh, I was going to say repeat the stretching algorithm again on this. Stretching yeah, it would like almost work, except like we were before using like blank to like know when we were at the end of the character. But actually, you can replace the shift right by shift right three or something, and the question should work the same. Yeah, or you could instead of writing a blank, write like a marked blank, <laughs> right? And then it would treat that as like kind of a normal character that it was shifting, and then when you're finished, you could go all the way back and change all the marked blanks to actual blanks. So there's like many, many tricks you could uh, do. And like I feel embarrassed to be like talking about all these like silly tricks. It's like such a stupid programming language, but well, this, today's the last day for it. Um, yeah. So actually, uh, just in terms of efficiency here, uh, you can see that actually after you do this like initial stuff, you know, simulating one step of the old machine on the new machine, well, each one step on the old machine will take some constant number of steps on the new machine. You know, you'll have to like look at a couple of cells to figure out what it is. You know, do a couple of lesson writes. So this will also have constant slowdown. Uh, actually, there's a bit of a subtlety, which is that uh, I think this simulation, if the old machine ran in time t, the new one well, it runs in time order of t, because as I said, in the main part, each old step costs a constant number of steps in the new machine. But actually, you also pay a little bit for the beginning, where you stretch out the input. So maybe it'll be order order of t plus order n. This is to stretch out the input. So this is actually only order of t if t is at least n. But as a side note, in this simulation theorem, all these simulation theorems, we usually assume that the running time of the initial machine is at least linear. And this is a pretty mild assumption because, I mean, most Turing machines take at least n steps because they usually at least look at what the input is. So we all pretty much only consider running times are at least n steps. And in that case, order you know, t is bigger than n. So order t plus order n is the same as order t. Those are pretty minor points. Um, Doesn't yeah? stretching out take uh, n squared time? Um, ooh. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Hmm. The comment was, doesn't stretching it out take n squared time? Hmm, that's bad. I think the way we described it, it would, right? Is it possible to do it in order n time? Hmm. Why is stretching n squared? Well, the way we described it, it costs like n to like copy everything one cell over. And then you kind of have to do that for each substring, yeah? Uh, could you maybe do it by first doing a string copy over so you know exactly the width of two n and then do a single iteration back, basically. Hmm. Maybe. That would be order two, right? Which Nuts. Wait, how, do you how do you copy it? Yeah. Hmm. Copy it. Yeah, but I don't think you can copy it. All right, this is a good question. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's all think about it. I mean, I don't mind so much if it takes n squared. I mean, I don't mind so much if the simulation is not linear, but it'd be nice if you could do it. 
you can probably do it in this amount of time, but it might be trickier than that, uh, trickier than what I've written. Because yeah, it seem, seems that this stretching does take order n squared time. I wouldn't be surprised if you could kind of do the stretching on the fly as you're going along. Um, you wouldn't be able to tell what you had had to stretch. Yeah, you, you might, yeah. <coughs> I expect you can do it with some tricks, but like I think this is an example where I'd have to think about it. Yeah? So is the simulation not supposed to be like you assume that you're given the input and you're smarter so that like in the first place? Sorry? Uh, like when you simulate the big alphabet doing machine with the smaller one, uh, do we not assume that the input is like given to you in the first place in your smaller alphabet and put it as one? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to assume the input is in the zeros and ones. Okay, this is a good puzzle. I'll think about it. Yeah. Like in general, when we're remembering with the states, like you can't. It's not realistic to remember more than like one bit of information, right? Like. Um. Well. Like you'd exponentially increase. You can remember. You can effectively remember a constant number of bits of information using your state. So you're allowed to arbitrary number of states and we finite number and we don't really charge you for the number of states you use but sort of allows you to remember a constant number of things yeah are we concerned about the size of the tape alphabet that we are simulate, simulate printing down because would that come i mean technically that should come in the big old like yeah that's definitely true the size this constant depends on the size of the initial type alphabet that you're simulating because of, you know, if the initial tape alphabet, the big tape alphabet has like a million characters, then each step in the simulation is going to require at least like probably like log a million yeah, so steps. And log of the size of gamma. And yeah. Okay, let me move on. I'll, that's a great question to think about. Uh, I want to spend a little time on this, this one. Okay. So in particular, that means I have to tell you what is a multi-tape Turing machine. Um, so I won't define it totally formally because it's not really worth the time, but let me even just give you an example of what a two-tape Turing machine is. And I think it'll be obvious what a three-tape Turing machine is or a four-tape Turing machine. Okay, so I'll just draw the picture instead of defining it totally formally. So as you might expect, a two-tape Turing machine has two infinite tapes rather than just one. Okay, and the input, input is written on the first tape, and in general all the other tapes are initially blank. Okay, I say all the other, in this two tape example there's only one other one, but in general if it's three tape, the other two tapes will be blank. Um, as before, all tape cells hold a symbol from gamma. Okay. And there will be one head per tape. Okay, so you have like a separate read write tape or read write head per tape. Um, Okay, and the control or the code, you know, moves both tape heads simultaneously. And it can base its decision on the, both the symbols it's reading. And in one step it changes both, potentially changes both the symbols it's reading and moves both the heads in either direction it wants and goes to a new state. Okay, so just to fully further illustrate it, um, I'm showing an example of what like a line of code or a transition looks like in a two-tape Turing machine. You know the new like uh, source code lines. Will look like this. We'll have like a state, 
maybe it's q0, and then you'll have like head one is reading, maybe it's reading symbol zero, and head two is reading some other symbol, maybe blank. Okay. And then you'll have head one writes, maybe it writes one, and head one moves, maybe it moves right, and then head two writes, uh, whatever, zero, head two moves, It's convenient to allow this tape put when you have a multi-tape Turing machine, so I'll throw that in there. I'll say that multi-tape Turing machines are allowed to have the state put move. Uh, and then the new state, is, I don't know, maybe it's Q7 or something. Okay, so this is what like a line for a two-tape Turing machine will look like based on what state you're in, what symbols the first and second heads are reading. You can change the tape cell that the two heads are reading, you can move them independently, and you switch to a new state. Okay, and you can imagine that if there were three tape cells, three, sorry, three tapes, you'd have a new symbol here, and two more columns here for the third tape head. Okay, and yeah, let me leave it at that. Any questions? So let me talk about, uh, for the end of the lecture, how to simulate, uh, let's say, two tape machine mm, well, let me make it a three tape machine just so it's a bit more general, and three by a one tape machine. M1. Okay, so I'm going to imagine that I actually have some three tape Turing machine called M3, <coughs> and I want to write some code for a normal one tape Turing machine, which I'll call M1, that has the same operation. And I'm going to show you how you can do it, such that the slowdown is about quadratic. Okay. All right, any ideas? Yeah? Uh, similarly to multi-tapes, as um, expand the alphabet to be, for example, so 0, 1 blank, e, 0, 1 blank is a character, and then 1 blank is a character, etc. And then simulate it as we did before. Ah. So you're saying you can, like, put the tapes on top of each other and, like, have, like, now you'd have a tape cell that had, like, I and blank? Yeah. Hmm, I didn't think about that. Let me think about that. Okay, that, that would work somewhat, but there's, there's two real difficulties you have to face. One is that, like, yeah, you've got to, like, let's say if there's three tapes or two tapes or whatever, you've got to keep track of the contents of both tape cells, or both tapes. And as you said, you could do that, for example, by, like, superimposing them and, like, having bigger um, tape alphabet. Um, there's another difficulty, though, which is that the two tape heads could potentially be very far apart. But on a one tape Turing machine, on this M1, you have to keep track of, in some sense, where both the tape heads are. So how are you going to overcome that difficulty? Yeah? Like, well, my first thought was maybe, like, shift everything, like, do the stretching, and then, like, there's kind of two overlays <laughs> things, and then you have the second tape head marked with, like, a marked cell of some sort. Yeah. So I guess I, I never thought about it. There's a variety of ways it seems to, to handle uh, this issue of you've got to keep track of both the tapes or all three tapes. Um, but the other issue of like keeping track of where the three heads are, I think you can pretty much only do that by like marking cells and then having your one actual tape head like kind of keep going back and forth to see where the marked cells are representing the head positions. And this fact, keeping track of uh, where the tape heads are, 
is what ultimately leads to this quadratic slowdown. Um, okay, so I had a different, uh, slightly different way of keeping track of the three tapes. I think uh, either one will work, but let me just follow my notes so that I don't mess things up. So here are the ideas. So let's say you're going to store, you have three tapes, you know, this. is blank the tape. Okay, so say you have like M3 is going along and it, well, at some time like the contents of its three tapes are shown. It has one tape head here and its second tape head here and its third tape head here. Um, then in my simulation, when I'm simulating on a one tape Turing machine M1, I'm going to have this be my tape contents. It's super long. Um, so I'm going to use this punctuation symbol to help me out. Okay, so my one tape is going to look like this. I'm going to use the pound sign to delimit the contents of the first tape, and I'm going to use the mark to indicate that, kind of in my simulation, the first tape head was here on the I. All right, and then I'll do similar things here. Okay, I'm going to tape. So I'm not um, writing everything super carefully, but what I want to tell you is that like, if the, uh, the three-tape Turing machine gets into this kind of configuration, I'm going to store that in the one-tape Turing machine like this, with these hash marks to delimit the three tapes and the dots representing where the tape heads are. Yep? With this encoding, wouldn't you have a problem if instead of this is the, this is the tape, so double E, you're going to have to push everything to the right or something? Yeah, if I understand what you're asking, there's going to be one major painful part of this encoding, which there's no way you can get around, which is that, um, you know, when you're doing the simulation, you know, if this tape head were actually here and it tried to go left, you would need to get a space in here. And so there's nothing you can do except, like, do a subroutine that, like, copies everything to the right and, like, costs you a lot of time. But you can do it. So... Let me sketch out in the last, I guess, six minutes how this will go. OK, so here are the ideas behind the simulation. So sort of stage one is to um, get to this format initially. Okay, so for example, um, the actual M one tape Turing machine, you know, gets its input like this, and it's got to convert it so that it looks like, you know, pound input star. Right, so it has to convert this tape to this tape at the beginning of its operation. Okay, so that's kind of a hassle. I mean, you got to probably shift everything or uh, you can go left and write this pound and put a dot on the first cell and walk to the end and put this junk on the end. So you can do all that with a one tape clearing machine. And I guess this will cost you about, 
if the input is of length n, how much time will it cost you probably to get it into this format? Big O of? I think you can do it in big O of n. You don't have to do too much. The main thing you have to do is spend n time like walking to the end so you can write this junk at the end. OK. So now it'll go into the main simulation. And again, I'm going to write this at a pretty high level. But you need to figure out the three cells, that the, the three symbols that the heads are reading. So you're going to go into like some scan, right? One, and when the marked symbol is seen, you know, remember it. In your state. So as you're going along, if you see like the marked cells in I, you're going to enter in like a new like scanning right state that said, you know, scanning right and remembering I. So you'll have to actually have many states to remember all these symbols. You'll have a similar thing for all three tapes. Okay, so what I'm saying is you'll have like some subroutine that in general makes a big pass over everything and takes note of where the three marked cells are. And every time it sees a marked cell, it kind of remembers in its state what character it saw. So at this point, the you know, M1 kind of knows um, the state and three um, red tape symbols. OK, so M1 can kind of know, for example, that in its simulation, M3 was in this state, and it could figure out the three symbols that were being read. So now it kind of knows what it needs to do. I'm almost done here. Kind of needs to, it knows how it needs to move all the three tape heads, and what symbols to write underneath the tape heads, and what state to go into. Okay, so now it's going to do the needful, as they say. So it'll like make another scan through. You know, doing the updates as necessary. And uh, the main difficulty is, as mentioned, the tape head, you know, a tape head might try to move onto uh, one of these pound signs. You know, if the M3 decides that it wants to move this tape head to the left, we need to open up space for it here. Okay. So if this happens, you need to do a subroutine that shifts the entire tape one cell to open up some space. Just one sec. So I'm basically out of time, so I guess I'll have to stop here. Um, this is basically the idea, is maybe I'll remind you of it a little bit more next class. Uh, one thing I didn't get quite a chance to do is understand uh, how much time this takes in terms of the running time of M3. And the high-level idea is that it's going to take about t squared time, because if the initial machine ran in time t, 
the length of this simulation tape will never be more than about three times t because the initial machine cannot write to more than t different tape cells. So all these tapes will have length about t. But simulating one step on the old machine takes time about t on the new machine. So this is where the t squared comes from. But I'll do this a bit more carefully next time. <laughs>